get that stuff off of us. And worship is a time to do that. And so I pray that you were able to enter into that time of worship and you found relief. Now I begin our time by saying something to you that I know that you already know. And that is that life can be difficult. Life can be difficult. Life can be hectic and chaotic and just crazy. Amen. If you live life any length of time, you know, again, life can be difficult, chaotic, crazy, stressful. We all experience it. Now, what we're going to talk about today is this. We're going to talk about why life is that way and how we can change that. So if you will, begin looking with me at what the Bible says in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 10. We're going to start reading right there in verse 38. And it reads, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened a home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has, my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset by many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it would not be taken away from her. So I there, if you will, let me have your attention. Before we begin to break this thing down, I want you to understand something. I want you to see something. I want you to listen to Jesus' response to Martha, this time coming from the New Living Translation. In Luke chapter 10, in verses 41 and 42, in the Living Tra New Living Translation, Jesus said this, But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all of these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it would not be taken away from her. One thing. One thing, says the Lord, worth being concerned about. And see, that's because the one thing in that one thing, all of the answers to all of the situations and the troubles that you and I as human beings face is found in that. It's found in that one thing. Listen to what the Bible has to say in, in the book of Psalms. In Psalms 27, in verses 4 through 6, it says this. One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent, and set me high upon a rock. Then it says, then, then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. See, one thing is needed. And that one thing is the Lord. Because as we sung in the song, victory is found in Jesus. Victory is found in him. He is the one who causes us to be victorious. He is the one who causes us to triumph over all of our enemies. Listen to this. These, again, are the words of Jesus found in John's gospel, in John chapter 16. In John 16, in the latter part of verse 33, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. Notice that. You will have trouble. Not you might have trouble. Not you could 
have trouble, but you will have trouble. But Jesus says, take heart. I have overcome the world. See, every problem, every difficulty, every temptation that you and I could ever face, Jesus has already faced, and he was victorious over them. See, that's what the wilderness temptation was about. Some of you know the story of that Jesus went up to where John the Baptist was baptizing. And Jesus was baptized in the Jordan there. But when Jesus came out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus and he was filled with the Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit. And then the Spirit led Jesus out in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan threw everything he had at Jesus. He threw every temptation that he had at Jesus. Every temptation that you and I face, Jesus already faced and fought and won. Every temptation. Now, I know to a lot of people, temptation seems to come in a lot of different varieties. In fact, as life goes on, you seem to be going sometimes saying, man, saying like there's more temptation than there's ever been. No, temptation comes down to three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Three temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So everything, everything, here's Satan going at Jesus, head up with all of his power, everything, he's throwing it at Jesus for 40 days, 40 nights. Not for a few minutes, not for a few hours, not an overnight thing, but 40 days, 40 nights. Jesus not only stood, he was victorious. And the thing that we must understand is this, Jesus was not out there fighting for himself. He was out there fighting for us. See, the Bible says that he is our kinsman, redeemer. He is our blood close relative. So his victory is our victory. And so the key to our victory is coming to him and to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And see, Mary understood that. That's why she put Jesus first. Now, we look at Mary and we look at Martha. I mean, there's many times, again, when we look at Martha, we begin to rag on Martha. Oh, Martha, you just running around doing this and you're caught up in all the rest of that. Martha, Martha, Martha. But the truth be known, Martha's us. How many times do we run around we run it over here and we run it over there and we got all of this stuff on us and weighing us down. And then many times we go to Jesus to tell Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? Can I get an amen? Jesus, don't you care? Jesus, don't you see what I'm going through? Jesus, Jesus, what about this? And we just like Martha running all over the place. But when you look at Martha, we can understand that. But we can also understand how she felt, especially you ladies. See, because I understand, Jesus has come to town, and Jesus came to her house for dinner. Now, you know if Jesus coming to your house for dinner, you don't give Jesus no fish sticks. Amen? You don't feed Jesus no fish sticks. You don't go to the refrigerator and find anything that's not green or doesn't have any fur on top of it or doesn't smell. Here you go, Jesus, chomp on this. No, you go all out. You ladies know there's, there's certain things that you cook. You only cook once or twice a year because it takes so long, but you love to cook it, but you only cook it once or twice a year, normally on Thanksgiving or Christmas. 
Thanksgiving or Christmas, we go all out because it's a special occasion, amen? I mean, we clean the house. We get out the good dishes that only see the light of day maybe once or twice a year. The good dishes that if the kids touch, you smack them and holler. You better put my dish in that cabinet. I still hear my mother hollering. One day, I couldn't find something to eat off. And I went in her china cabinet and got a dish. Before I could even get to the kitchen, she was screaming, boy, you better put my dish up there. And then she had these decorative hand towels in the bathroom. And I used it. Boy, are you crazy? You don't use my towel. So you know, again, Christmas and Thanksgiving, we go all out. We clean the house. We take out the good dishes. We prepare the meal because it's a special occasion. Not too long ago, I was telling my wife how as a boy, I used to hate it when my Aunt Eleanor came to town. See, because my Aunt Eleanor, that was my mom's big sister. And when Aunt Eleanor came to town, mom would have us kids stretched out. I mean, we washing windows. We're not just cleaning the house. I mean, we washing windows. We cleaning our closets. You know, we not only cleaning our room, we had to clean under the bed. I'm going, Ma, Aunt Eleanor is not going to come in my room and get on her knees and look under my bed. It's not going to happen. You don't know that. You don't know that. That's Aunt Eleanor, and she's very particular like that. And she was. So mom would have us again washing windows. We got to get, get the good dishes out. We have to wash them. We have to clean out the closets. We have to clean under the bed. And then, and then on top of all of that, then somebody had to go to the laundromat. Because the laundromat, they had the big jumbo washers. And mom wanted you to take all of those throw rolls throughout that house, put them in that thing, and take them up there and wash them. Aunt Eleanor is coming. Oh, no. No. Oh, my God. I love Aunt Eleanor, but I don't want her coming to my house, though. So now, if we feel that way about special occasions, if we feel that way about certain family members, how do you think Martha is feeling when Jesus is coming to her house for dinner, Martha is in a full court press. Let's get this thing done. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. And that is that Jesus wasn't looking for any of that. Jesus wasn't requiring any of that, nor was Jesus impressed by any of that. And let me say that again. Jesus wasn't looking for any of that. He wasn't asking for any of that. He wasn't impressed by any of that. Remember who Jesus is. He is the king of glory. He's the king of heaven. Heaven where the streets are paved with gold. Heaven where the gates are made of pearl. The Bible teaches and tells us that the earthly temple in all of its splendor and all of its glory was only a copy, a copy of the heavenly one, but the heavenly one was made of better materials. And so Jesus is not impressed by all of that. You know what impresses Jesus? Check this out. Some of you know this story. It's found in the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12 and verses 41 and 44, it says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put. 
and watch the crowds putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything she had to live on. So what impresses Jesus is this, is when we give him our awe and faith. It's not about, again, the, the dollar amount. It's not about the, the hours of service that we put in. What impresses Jesus is when we give him our all by faith. That impresses him. Jesus likes that. Hmm, check this out. Some of you know this story. This is found in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 26. In verses 20, I'm sorry, in verses uh, 6 through 13. It says, while Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told of her in memory. What I want you to see is this. In all three of these cases that we looked at, what impressed Jesus was that these people gave their all to him in faith. And it started in the heart. It started in the heart. First, they gave themselves to the Lord. Then they gave everything else to the Lord. Hear that. It's not again about the dollar amount. It's not about the hours that we serve, about the hours that we put in. These women gave their all to the Lord in faith. It came from their heart. First, they gave themselves to the Lord. And then everything else from there followed. Mm. Which is why Jesus tells us this. Many of you know this passage of scripture, which is found in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so the question on the floor is, where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? I want you to think about something. What is it that moves you? What is it that drives you? What is it that motivates you? Think about that. Think about that. Go through your heart. Go through your life. Think about it. What is it that moves you? What is it that drives you? What is it that motivates you? I told you years ago how that the thing that used to, to drive me, the thing that used to motivate me the most was a drop top, white, two-seater Mercedes. Man, every time I saw that thing going up the street, I'd be drooling. Ah, gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it. So again, question. Think about it. What is it that drives you? What is it, is it that pushes you? What is it that motivates you? Now, when you find that thing, when you grasp that thing that drives you, that motivates you, that pushes you, when you find that thing, 
Ask yourself this question. Does that thing in here on the earth or does it go on to eternity? See, that Mercedes that I wanted so bad, that ends here on the earth. Now, when I wanted that Mercedes like that, man, that was back in the 1980s. And if I would have gotten that Mercedes in the 80s, right about now, that Mercedes probably a block of steel sitting out in the junkyard somewhere. It ends here on the earth. So again, think about it. What drives you? What motivates you? And where does it end? Does it end here on the earth or does it carry on to eternity? See what Mary desired went on to eternity, which is why Jesus says it would not be taken from her. It's not going to be taken from her. So, kind of moving on, and we're almost about ready to wrap this thing up. I want you to check out something else that Jesus said. Jesus said this in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 6, in verses 34, I mean 30, 33 and 34. Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom, talking about his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, then all these things will be given to you as well. Think about that. Again, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, then all of these other things will be added on to you. What makes life so hard? What makes life so difficult for us as human beings is because we seek the stuff and maybe try to add the Lord on. What drives us mostly as human beings is the stuff. Got to have the house. I want the house. I want the house. I want the car. I want this. I want the shiny stuff. I want the bling bling. These are the things that drive us. These are the things that move us. What moves us so many times is MasterCard. And why do you think they call it MasterCard? Because it's your master. You better get yourself up out of that bed and go to work so you can pay the bill. So again, most of the stuff that drives us, again, are, are the things of this world. And that's what makes life so hard. That's what makes life so difficult. Again, we, 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 we are pressing. We're driving, trying to get the stuff. You know the post, the, uh, the bumper sticker? He who uh, dies with the most toys wins. We think that it's human being. We think because we have a lot of stuff that that's going to make us happy. I'm here to tell you it won't. I don't have a lot, but there's been times in my life when I have everything that I wanted and it was not satisfying. I've told you before how that as a young man, a young single man, I had the job, I had the bachelor pad, I had the bling bling, I had so much money in my pockets, I had the mumps, they were swole. I had the girly girls. And everybody knew about it. Everybody said there was no fighting. Bing, bing. But I go to my dad because I'm empty. Yo, pop. Now what? I knew it wasn't more money. I knew it wasn't more girls. I knew it wasn't a bigger house or a nicer car. I had everything I wanted. But I was empty. And one cool thing about finding yourself empty is now you know you have a need. When you find yourself empty, now you know you have a need. And I'm trying to tell you today that that need and the only thing that can fill that need is Jesus. The reason why life is so hard, the reason why life is so Difficult because again, we're, we're running after the stuff, and we maybe might sometimes add Jesus on. And that's not only just for people in the world, that goes for us as Christians. Many times, when it comes to the Lord, sometimes the Lord is the 
Last one hired and the first one fired. Many times when it comes to the Lord, he's the last one hired and the first one fired. I've been doing this, uh, this Christian thing for quite a, quite a time now. And I've seen some stuff in the church, stuff like this. People on schedule to serve on a Sunday morning. And they'll call you and tell you, hey, hey, I, I, I can't come today. I can't come. No, I had family come in to, to town. Bring them to church with you then. Bring them to church. If they don't want to come to church, tell me see them later. No, we dropped Jesus. I'm seeing the people say, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you know, I, I, I know I made a commitment, Lord. You know, I was going to bring my, you know, my tithes and my offerings into the house. But, Lord, this week, I had to buy tithes for the car. This week, Lord, you know, the fridge went out and... So, Lord, I'm going to have to drop you off. Seeing people even ministering, uh, supposed to minister to their own brothers and sisters. It's like, yeah. I was speaking to uh, brother and so-and-so last week, and they're having a hard time. So I told my brother, you know, hey, you know what? After service next week, we're going to go out to lunch. We're going to chop it up. Okay, we on? Bet, set, down. Man. Somebody just gave me some tickets to the game. I ain't going with my brother. I'm going to the game. What makes life so hard? What makes life so difficult? As we seek the stuff, not the Lord. If you want to reverse the difficulty. If you want to reverse the hardness of life, seek the first, the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, then all of these other things will be added onto you as well. Are you listening to me? Because again, we can run from pillar to post. You know, oh, I know what it is, you know. Okay, I need to get rid of this dude and get me a new dude. The new dude going to be a, car a carbon copy of the old dude because we all flesh and blood and we all broken. Some are more broken than others when it comes to sin. Some are regular sinners. Some are professional sinners. But we all sinners. Can I get an amen? Some, hey, I got this job, and this job is good. But, man, when I get over here, it's going to get better. I think I was talking to uh, Noreen a couple of weeks ago. And those of you who have gotten older, you know this to be true. When you're a child, you think mommy and daddy get it all together. Amen? But when you become the parent, you know you're getting by by the hair of your chinny chin chin. You know, you're running around there trying to hold things together. You're around there trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. You think you're about to lose your ever-loving mind. Calgon, take me away. But you think mommy and daddy got it all together until you become the parent. And when you become the parent, you go, oh, man, this is what life is like. But then you also, when you start working, you're thinking, man, okay, well, I'm on this job here, man, and they don't have their act together. So, But when I get over here to this company, man, everything going to be smooth. You get over here, and after a little while, you look up and you go, man, it's the same old, same old. This is a bigger, more polished version. But you know what? I know who has it all together, the government. Why y'all laughing? Oh, you realize that them jokers don't have it all together. Amen? I don't know about you, but the more I look at the government, the more I go, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. I see why you say pray for those who are leadership over you. Jesus, look on the president. Look on the governor, Lord, look on the mayor, look on the dog catcher, Jesus, 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 Jesus. We need you, sweet Jesus. 
And so again, if we're going to take the weight, if we're going to lift the, the burdens off of our lives, and again, we go into the Lord, we cry just like Martha, Lord, 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 don't you see this? Don't you see this? Lord, don't you care? You see, yes, I care. I'm sitting at my feet. Mary has chosen the better thing. Martha, they ain't asking for that 25 course meal. Can't impress me with that. I appreciate your heart, but I don't need all that. I don't want no fish sticks, no either. One thing, one thing, one thing is necessary, one thing is needed. Is found in me. See, again, Mary chose the things of eternity. And so have I. And so have some of you. So I've told you before how that I want my life to outlive me. I want my life to outlive me. I want to pass down a Godly legacy. Not just to my wife and my children and to my grandchildren. Not just to my personal family, but to mankind. I want to pass on a godly legacy. I want to lay a foundation that other people can walk into the kingdom of God upon what I've done. I want to hear at the end of this journey, well done, good and faithful servant, well done done. And so therefore I'm going to work until the end laying the foundation so that other people can walk across and get into heaven. I don't care. I don't care if they don't know my name. I don't care. There's no plaque. There's no posters. There's no Memorial day or date. I don't care. As long as what I do can get them to Jesus. And I know that many of you feel the same way. Many of you feel the same way. Now, if you're here today and you feel that way, I'm going to invite you to come and be a part of our team. If you're watching online, and you say you want your life to outlive you. I'm going to invite you to come and be a part of our team. To be a part of this kingdom business. This kingdom work. Where's Mr. Keyline? Come on, Mr. Keyline. I want you to be a part of this work. Now, when I think about kingdom work and think about kingdom building the first step the first thing in kingdom building is this souls being saved the bible tells us this in the book of John John chapter 3 and verse 17 it says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, that the world might be saved through him. A lot of people think that Jesus came to condemn. No, he didn't. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. Again, I told you earlier when he's out there battling with the enemy, he wasn't fighting for himself. He was fighting for us. And so the first step in the kingdom building is receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So if you're here today and you're sick and tired, being sick and tired, if you're here today and you get weight and you get pressure, you find yourself in bondage. 
and you want out. Today is the day. Jesus says, come. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man will open the door, says the Lord, I'll come in. Jesus will not, and he never will, kick the door in to your life. When God created man, he gave man a free will. And he would never override that free will. But sometimes people say, well, if, if God is so good, if God is so kind, God is so gracious, God is so merciful, why is there so much evil in the world? Free will. Free will. There's a, a very interesting question that's found in the Bible. We talked about it in our prayer time this morning. Jesus goes to a man who is sick and says, do you want to be made whole? Now you would think that's a dumb question. If the man is sick, of course he wants to be made whole. But believe it or not, there's a lot of sick people who don't want to be made whole. They want to hold on to their sickness. They're comfortable in this sickness. I know this relationship is killing me, but I'm holding on. I'm holding on. I won't let go. I know this job is killing me. I can't let go. So this morning the Lord says, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? I'm willing. I'm going to ask for the prayer partners to come forward. And if you're here today and you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can come and pray with one of the prayer partners. Or maybe you've already received Jesus as your Savior. Or maybe you find yourself in a backslidden state. You said yes to the Lord, but the the world has grabbed a hold of you again and this, the weeds of life has choking out the life of God. Come. Be refreshed. Be made whole. Or maybe again it's just